Hi guys, it is a gorgeous day here in the End Times in Paradise in St. Croix Virgin Islands. I've been out, been out snorkeling all morning, so I'm running a little bit late on this week's Doomsday Sermon where I read from you from one of my new favorite Bibles of the Apocalypse that the universe has put in my hand. And this week, Sancho Ponza and I are going to share with you a... A fun little read, a fun little read, which of course has behind the fun little read a very serious story. This is the Radioactive Boy Scout, the frightening true story of a whiz kid and his homemade nuclear reactor by a journalist Ken Silverstein, an, an excellent read. It's a short little book. I'm about halfway through it. So the, the book is built around this true story of this kid who actually, a, a Boy Scout, who uh, actually built a nuclear reactor in, uh, in his backyard in suburban Detroit. And, you know, if he had, if he had had like a thimble full of plutonium to, to stir into this thing, he could have blown up the city of Detroit, which of course, come to think of it, would have been a good step in the right direction, but we're not going to go there. But anyway, uh, wrapped around the, the kernel of the story about this kid is, uh, you know, uh, an investigative look into the nuclear industry and uh, this th this chapter here is chapter two I'm going to be reading from from the radium from the radium craze to the soaring 60s science conquers all this is th this is where doomsday prophecy meets environmental alarmism meets conspiracy theory i will wind up with anyone who doesn't understand the conspiracy of the nuclear industry so what he does in this chapter is he follows the nuclear uh industry from uh the big the discovery of x-rays in 1896 through to the year 1960 when the Rockefellers came out with their report. So we're going to end up with the Rockefellers. But uh, starting out, for anyone who doesn't understand this, <clears throat> from the beginning, the history of radioactivity and atomic research has been marked by cycles in which amazing discoveries <coughs> produce mass elation only to give way to fear of the consequences of the new knowledge. So he starts it back in 1896 uh, with the discovery of, of x-rays and how immediately uh, people started dying of radiation poison. But apparently didn't mean much, because even then, even, even when uh, these doomsayers, uh, you know, whining about this new technology, even then, researchers and the public gave little thought to the potential dangers of radioactive materials. In fact, a new and more hysterical period of popular, commercial, and scientific enthusiasm was generated by research into radium radium, which the Curies had discovered in 1898. This is Sir William Ramsey, a leading expert on the new field of radioactivity, believed there were no limits to what radium might mean to the world. Quoting this guy, quote, the philosopher's stone will have been discovered, and it is not beyond the bounds of possibility that it may lead to that other goal of the philosophers of the dark age, the elixir vitae, he prophesied, referring to the mythical tonic that ensured health and longevity. So this is the radium craze. I have to admit, I was completely 
clueless about the radium craze. I, I was un, uh, uh, aware of this, that in the early 20th centuries, this is this radioactive shit called radium. Patients received radium injections to treat high blood pressure, menstrual cramps, depression, and an ailment that doctors labeled debutantes fatigue. By the 1930s, hundreds of radium-based products, including eyewashes, suppositories, and even candies were available to the public. And they were completely unregulated. And uh, so guess what? Same has happened to x-rays. Here we go again. Deja vu all over again. X-rays had already demonstrated that external sources of radiation could lead to grave health problems. But in the mid-1920s, radium provided the first signs that ingesting radioactive materials could be equally deadly. At that time, American newspapers were filled with stories about a group of former workers, all of them women, at a U.S. radium plant in East Orange, New Jersey, who were dying from radioactive poisoning. The cause was this product called Undark, Undark, a radioluminescent paint used to make clock dials glow in the dark, and this shit went right on up through 1968. Um, yes, uh, the, the case of the radium dial women led to a lawsuit in 1928. Many of the victims were so depleted by cancer that they had to be carried to the witness stand. One could not raise her hand to take the oath. During the court proceedings, U.S. Radium, I guess U.S. Radium Incorporated, argued that its product, Undark, had nothing to do with the workers' deaths. Company lawyers insisted that radium was harmful only in, har in higher doses. The smaller amounts that the women had ingested would have had, quote, a beneficial and not a baneful effect. The company suggested that the women's problems were, quote, psychological, saying that radium, quote, because of the mystery which surrounds much of its actions, is a topic which stimulates the imagination, and to our mind, it is to this, and not to actual fact, that many of the reports of the luminous paint's effects in our pl plant may be attributed. Yes, as I say, that, and they kept making this shit until 1968. But uh, while that was still going on, it was 1938 is when, is when all hell began to break loose on this planet. This is, it was in 1938 that the German chemist and physicist Otto Hahn uh, was firing neutrons at uranium nuclei. His experiments ultimately succeeded in splitting the uranium atom, thereby demonstrating the, that poten the potential of chain reactions and rendering atomic power and the bomb a real possibility rather than a pipe dream. Scientific euphoria again bubbled over. It was as if the deaths and disease caused by radium had never occurred. This was a 1940 Collier's Magazine mainstream media article by uh, R.M. Langer, a physicist at the California Institute of Technology which breathlessly foretold of the uranium-powered future. Energy would be so cheap, quote, it isn't even worth making a charge for it, he predicted. Meanwhile, roads and highways would disappear as Americans would travel in gigantic uranium-powered vehicles with enormous soft tires that would spare the countryside. 
For long distance travel, families would climb aboard their personal atomic airplanes, which would soar 50 miles above the Earth and reach speeds of several thousand miles an hour. This vision of a brave new world was not an unrealizable utopia, said Langer, but, quote, a statement of fact that will profoundly change for the better the daily lives of you and yours. The foundations of the happy era have already been laid, close quote. For one and all, the nuclear future promised, quote, unparalleled richness and opportunities, privilege and class distinctions and other sources of social uneasiness and bitterness will become relics because things that make up the good life will be so abundant and inexpensive. War itself will become obsolete because of the disappearance of those economic stresses that have caused it. Industrious, powerful nations and clever, aggressive races can win at peace far more than could ever be won at war. That was written in 1940. But the Adams' first contribution to military history was not to eradicate war, but to serve as the foundation for the first weapons of mass destruction. Yes, and uh, so they talk about, uh, y y you know, the Manhattan Project and Robert Oppenheimer and all of these guys. Uh, one of the men, uh, e even then, the scientists were fearful of what they had unleashed. One of the men uh, the, from the Manhattan Project, Leo Zillard, said, quote, this day would go down as a black day in the history of mankind, close quote, and the first tiny nuclear chain reaction which took place in a small reactor. Um, and so now, so then, I, and I need to skip forward, so they talk about the Manhattan Project and, and, and how they were figuring out all of this shit uh, in the first half of the 1940s. <clears throat> Skipping ahead. The world's first atomic blast took place during the pre-dawn hours of July 16, 1945 at a test site in the basin of New Mexico's Hemis Mountains. The result stunned even the Manhattan Project scientists on hand who watched from bunkers 10,000 yards away, a mushroom cloud shoot 30,000 feet into the air. It was reported that the bomb's blast emitted such intense light that some people living 50 miles away were certain that the sun had risen twice that day. <clears throat> Even more astonishing is that the light penetrated the consciousness of a blind girl who lived more than 100 miles away. Reactions among the very people who created the atomic bomb were a conflictive mix of euphoria and dread. Quote, I am become death, said Robert Oppenheimer, quoting from the Bhagavad Gita, the destroyer of worlds. Test director Ken Bainbridge remarked after the blast, quote, Now we are all sons of bitches. Less than one month later, the U.S. warplane Enola Gay dropped a four and a half ton uranium bomb nicknamed Little Boy on Hiroshima, Japan. I think we've all heard of how in the flash of an instant, 60,000 people were killed and 69,000 people were injured, many mortally. Jesus, I, uh, many, many, many people thought the world had come to an end, that the destruction that surrounded them had nothing to do with the war, but that the earth 
itself had collapsed. Some of the people, so again, some of the very people on the Manhattan Project who, who developed uh, the, this, this damn thing were chastened by the effects of the new weapon. Quoting this guy, Leo Zillard, uh, again, quote, Using atomic bombs against Japan is one of the greatest blunders of history from the point of view of our moral position. Yes, it is very difficult to see what wise course of action is possible from here on. This was uh, in 1945. A month earlier, Zillard had circulated a petition to Manhattan Project scientists opposing use of the bomb. Among those who refused to sign his, his petition was Edward Teller, who later built the first hydrogen bomb. In replying to Zillard, he wrote, quote, First of all, this is Edward Teller, First of all, let me say that I have no hope of clearing my conscience. The things we are working on are so terrible that no amount of protesting or fiddling will, with politics will save our souls. But I am still not really convinced of your objections. I do not feel that there is any chance now to outlaw any one weapon. Our only hope is getting the facts of our results before the people. This might help convince everybody that the next war would be fatal. For this purpose, actual combat use might even be the best thing. There you go. Thank you, Edward Teller. And for the most part, the destruction of Hiroshima did little to dampen the can-do spirit of the nuclear crowd. Even as the city lay in flames and ruins, Secretary of War Henry Stinson announced that nuclear fission would ultimately enrich our civilization. It appears inevitable, he said after the bomb blast, that many useful contributions to the well-being of mankind will ultimately flow from these discoveries when the world situation makes it possible for science and industry to concentrate on these aspects. Yes, uh, quoting uh, David Littlethal, the first chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, expressed the grim determination that, quote, the discovery that had produced so terrible a weapon simply had to have an important use other than blowing up the planet. Uh, <clears throat> Soon after, soon after uh, news of the bombing of Japan, John O'Neill, science editor of the New York Herald Tribune, uh, rushed Almighty Adam, the real story of atomic energy, into print. It bubbled with the same utopian spirit that marked so much of the prophetic writing of the early atomic age. The blast of the first atomic bomb ushered in a new era of civilization, a new power age, said the book. Uh, talking about uh, how the atomic energy will allow an automobile to run for 50 years without stopping, to keep an airplane in the air indefinitely, to drive the Queen Mary ocean liner on countless transoceanic trips, uh, treat homes for years. It did not seem an overstatement, this is still quoting uh, this story, to call the release of atomic energy the biggest news in history. According to O'Neill, this is in the mid-1940s, the oil and coal industries would soon go the way of the dinosaur 
and lubratoriums would replace gas station. Uh, one sci once scientists devised a safe radioactive fuel tank, a minor hurdle that O'Neill predicted would be quickly overcome. Atomic powered planes would fill the skies. What is striking about O'Neill's and other similar love poems to atomic power is that as yet there existed no industrial technology to harness the force. Yet the awesome power and potential of uranium seduced normally reserved scientists and intellectuals who longed to develop this force of energy. And then they go on from there from uranium, uh, you know, looking in the uranium mining, uh, which produced a mammoth environmental disaster. This is talking about in Utah as millions of tons of radioactive tailings and waste piled up in the region over the decades. Uh, I think they're still trying to clean up. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're still trying to clean up that place in uh, in Utah. Let's see. This is, uh, I think, or this is Robert Wilson. I, I think they're saying he is one of two scientists who are exposed to critical levels of plutonium while working on the Manhattan Project. Both died shortly thereafter. Uh, quote, Robert, quoting Robert Wilson, quote, if there ever was an element that deserved a name associated with hell, it is plutonium. And then they talk about, they go into this discussion of plutonium, about how it was going to save the damn planet. And the Rocky Flats plant in Colorado where plutonium was produced for America's nuclear weapons program. The total number of employee casualties is not known, but it is believed that hundreds of workers there went to early graves and starting in 1952. And the government admitted only in 1999 that workers at Rocky Flats and other plants involved in bomb making had died or become ill due to radiation exposure. As many as 6,000 employees or their descendants were to be compensated with payments of $150,000. And uh, so then they start talking about the arms race kicking off in 1953 when it was learned in 1953 that the Soviet Union had developed the H-bomb, nuclear madness reached a fever pitch and the arms race began in earnest. That year, the New York Times turned the government's nuclear testing program into a spectator sport when it dubbed bomb watching an, quote, an honorable pastime where upcoming nuclear tests were un announced by the press and thousands of residents of western states pulled out their lawn chairs and sipped iced tea as they observed mushroom clouds rising over the desert from almost 100 A-bombs that were detonated. Oppenheimer by this time had now become an opponent of uh, atomic warfare after he compared the United States and the Soviet Union to quote two scorpions in a bottle close quote Oppenheimer was denounced as a spineless commie sympathizer before long though public fears about a possible nuclear war with the Soviet Union led to a vibrant political movement calling for abolition of the bomb the anti-nuclear cause was most clearly espoused by Allen Ginsberg, who wrote in his poem, America, go fuck yourself with your atom bomb. And then talking about the uh, Dr. Strangelove, 
but all the while the the federal government insisted there was little to fear and assured Americans that just about everyone would survive a nuclear attack anyway as long as they took appropriate precautions and talking about that hilarious film Atomic Cafe uh, you know the duck and cover where they, they, you know, if you've seen Atomic Cafe, if you haven't, you got to go see it. It's all over YouTube. Where the Atomic Energy Commission actually trying to convince people the way to save yourself from an atomic uh, blast was to roll out of your chair and put your hands over your face. <clears throat> and then the commercial nuclear age. So now we're getting into the wacky conspiracy theory angle of this in the closing of this chapter. The commercial nuclear age opened in 1957 when the first atomic energy plant opened in Pennsylvania with backing from the government's Atoms for Peace program. Even before the plant opened, nuclear power advocates were confidently predicting that household appliances would not simply run on atomic energy, but would have their own internal nuclear generators. Quoting uh, Alexander Lloyd, president of this vacuum cleaner company, quote, nuclear powered vacuum cleaners will probably be a reality in 10 years. That was from 1957. And then guess what happened in 1959 and 1960? Of course, I was I came along in September of 1959 in the middle of a new Rockefeller report. How well, I knew that J.D. Rockefeller would have to appear in this rant sooner or later for anybody uh, who doesn't understand uh, how the Rockefellers. Uh, how uh, the federal government plays step and fetch it to the Rockefellers. Uh, listen to the close of this rant. <clears throat> In 1959 and 1960, the Rockefeller panel reports were published, having been overseen by Henry Kissinger, Dean Rusk, and other members of the political elite <coughs> uh, so Henry Kissinger and Dean Russ those were you know those Nixon cronies uh, if you don't know those names the the Rockefeller experts were concerned about sustaining high rates of economic growth and they believed atomic power would make that possible. Hmm. Quoting the Rockefeller report from 1959 and 60, quote, even now, even now, meaning 55 years ago, we can discern the outlines of a future in which through the use of the split atom, our resources of both power and raw materials will be limitless. In the 20th century, the unprecedented acceleration of scientific advance promises that we are on the threshold of a new age of science. Already, the proven resources of uranium and thorium and Thorium, in terms of energy equivalent, are at least 1,000 times the world's resources of coal, gas, and oil, close quote. And may I refer you to the UN climate talks from December 2015, where you heard the word thorium being bandied about. I believe, I believe that uh, I'm giving correct information. It is now the billionaire Bill Gates promoting how thorium is going 
to save the planet. I think somewhere in this book I learned that thorium has a half-life of 14 billion years. Uranium, I can't remember, is like 30,000 years or something, and thorium was in the billions of years. So 55 years ago, the Rockefellers were talking about thorium in our future. Gee, what a surprise to see thorium at the UN Paris Climate Talks. So three years later, so now we're talking the early 1960s, the National Academy of Sciences completed a report for President John F. Kennedy that endorsed the conclusions of the Rockefeller panelists, otherwise known as Henry Kissinger and Dean Rusk. The National Academy said that nuclear power would allow the United States to shift from a philosophy of conserving scarce resources to a policy described as, quote, the wise management of plenty. And as Secretary of Interior Stuart Udall later wrote of the study, and remember, and, and Stuart Udall was, was a progressive Democrat, I mean, a pretty good guy. He, so he is praising this study based on the Rockefeller panel, quote, it cemented the census about technology and implied that if we ran out of petroleum or iron ore or any other mineral, technology would soon come forth with a better, cheaper substitute." Close quote. Other than the cartoon illustrations, there is little that distinguishes the reports of the Rockefeller panel and the National Academy from the Golden Book of Chemistry experiments, this uh, high school textbook so treasured by David Hahn, the radioactive Boy Scout. And while it is easy to understand an adolescent boy's boundless enthusiasm for atomic power, the starry-eyed optimism of all those sober experts who preceded him is harder to explain. And it's not just the ones that preceded him. Good God Almighty, how about the ones that have succeeded him? You know, right up till today, as you're going to see more and more mainstream media articles cheering on nuclear power, particularly thorium reactors, as a way to save this planet. You know, and, and I would love to go on uh, and talk about the, how the Boy Scouts of America, the Boy Scouts of America are in bed with the, uh, the nuclear energy industry. It's a fascinating story, but that's another rant for another time for today's Doomsday Sermon for Sunday, January 31st, 2016. Don't forget the Radioactive Boy Scout by Ken Silverstein. Amen, Brother Ken. Bye, guys.